Well, ladies and gentlemen, distinguished guests, good morning to you all. And uh, Gordon, thank you very much for that warm welcome. And it was actually my second day as the Minister for Defence I was in, uh, in Singapore. But first of all, let me start by acknowledging the traditional custodians of the land on which we're having this very important conference today, the Wajak people of the Noongar Nation. And I also pay my respects to their elders, past, present and emerging. But today here, I think it's also very fitting for me to pay my respect to the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander men and women who have contributed so much uh, to our nation uh, as service personnel, both in times of war and in peace, and particularly uh, to Colleen and Ken's uncles, Lewis, Larry, Augustus and Kenneth Haywood, who she spoke about here today. It is a pleasure to again address this conference and it's wonderful to see so many friends and colleagues from here in Western Australia, but also, as we say here, those of you from over east and also from those of you from further away from overseas. You're all incredibly welcome here and uh, thank you for coming and participating in this conference. And particularly thanks to the Perth US Asia Centre, Defence West and also the WA government for putting on this very timely and very pertinent conference here today. Um, it is very fitting that we're discussing the Indo-Pacific here in Perth, the gateway to the Indian Ocean. Uh, the Indo-Pacific is dynamic, it's evolving and it is growing, but it is not without its challenges. Just as I said two days into my uh, job as Minister for Defence, uh, at the Shangri-La Dialogue, it was very clear to me a couple of things. Um, this conference, the Shangri-La Dialogue, which brings together military and policy leaders and thinkers from not only across our region now, but across the world. And it, the first thing was, it was clear that there are a lot of opportunities for us to pursue in the Indo part of the Indo-Pacific. But it was also very clear to me from uh, meetings with delegates, but also from the official speeches that the region is also very anxious. The US-China bilateral relationship is the most globally significant bilateral relationship today but it is in no country's best interest to see competition become adversarial. So today, I'd like to take this opportunity to outline how I see some of the challenges that we face and how we are responding as a nation to those challenges. But also how we're working to ensure that this nation is also best placed to take advantage of the opportunities that are also presenting themselves. And uh, is there a map up there? Ah, here we go, here it is. So as you can see, I use this map now to discuss where we see ourselves in the world and to remind people that Australia is actually a three ocean nation. We have the Southern Ocean, which is perhaps not as frequently thought about as others, but Australia's Antarctic Territory means we have a deep interest in the security of the Southern Ocean. We have the Pacific Ocean to our east and that, uh, that ocean is the subject of the focus of our Pacific Step Up program that is seeing an enhanced an enhancement, I'm sorry, of the Australia's long-standing engagement with the island nations of the Pacific. And of course, there's the Indian Ocean, which is the one that I will focus on here today. But it's an ocean that defines not just our security and our economic outlook for Australia, but it's also, it really defines our place in the world. And that's why today we talk about the Indo-Pacific region, a concept that has developed from our location at the fulcrum of the Indo-Pacific. But the Indian Ocean has not always received the same level of attention in our strategic thinking as the Pacific Ocean has in particular. And Australia for many years has tended to perceive itself more as a Pacific Ocean nation than an Indian Ocean nation. And it wasn't until 1987 that Australia adopted a two-ocean Navy policy, prompting the significant reposturing of Australian forces to the West. And uh, we owe Governor Beasley uh, a large vote of thanks uh, for his leadership in realising uh, that position. So today, up to half of our naval fleet is based permanently in Western Australia, including all six of our Collins-class submarines. But our equities in the Indian Ocean are also very clear. Approximately 42% of our exports by value depart from Western Australia. Our exclusive economic zone extends deep into the Indian Ocean, containing the strategically valuable territories of Christmas and Cocos Keeling Islands. 
The Indian Ocean is home to five of Australia's top 15 trading partners, India, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore and Thailand. And our LNG sector is booming largely thanks to the projects located off the northwest shelf. So for over 70 years, Australians have reaped the economic and security benefits a, a benign security environment in the Indian Ocean has afforded us. But that strategic landscape is changing very rapidly. We're living in the biggest realignment of the geopolitical landscape since World War II. Like the Pacific, the Indian Ocean is increasingly characterised by strategic competition and intensifying uh, great power rivalries. We've seen a proliferation of naval activity and also a race to secure access to strategic ports right across the Indian Ocean Rim, which afford both economic and also military and strategic advantages. India has emerged as an economic powerhouse and is demonstrating a leadership in a way that reflects its size and also its uh, deep adherence to democratic values. China has rapidly expanded its Indian Ocean footprint, establishing its first overseas military base in Djibouti uh, two years ago. And Beijing's burgeoning infrastructure investments under the Belt and Road and Maritime Silk Road initiatives are bringing profound changes to the Indian Ocean region. Other players, such as the United States, France, Indonesia, Sri Lanka and Japan, are also playing increasingly uh, large roles. And the emerging presence of a wider range of strategic players is creating a more congested and also a more contested regional environment. But while competition is growing, large swathes of the Indian Ocean remains ungoverned. And it is in these ungoverned seams where coercive statecraft, grey zone tactics and transnational crime have the potential to flourish. So amid this backdrop of rising opportunity and increasing risk, what are Australia's defence interests in the Indian Ocean and how do we protect them? Australia's Indo-Pacific vision for a region is for a region that is free, open and inclusive, where disputes are resolved peacefully without force or coercion. We want an Indian Ocean where international uh, law rules and norms are respected where investment and infrastructure builds growth and development rather than indebtedness and reliance. Where countries operate transparently and where the sovereignty of all states, large and small, is respected and protected. We also want a region where the security of critical resources is guaranteed, in particular the supply of rare earth elements and other critical minerals. Australia is the world's second largest producer of rare earths and is also endowed with critical minerals. Africa, our distant Indian nation neighbour, is another key source of these resources for the global market. Many of them are used in high-end and military technologies and these resources are now recognised by us and an increasing number of allies as essential for the economic and industrial development of the world's major economies. So their supply today is a strategic issue, not just a commercial issue. And I've got to say, I was very pleased this morning to see the announcement by Northern Minerals that they have uh, entered into an off-take agreement with Tyson Krupp. So I think that is a very important development in this area. So that's, that's a bit of an oversight of, of how I and the government see our strategic environment. So the next question is, how do we uh, rise to the challenges facing uh, our region? And I believe we do it in four ways. First of all is in strengthening our regional partnerships with existing and new allies and friends. We increase our presence, we build collaboration and we also invest in defence capability. All four of these are subtle but very powerful elements of our own national strategy for the security and prosperity uh, and, peace, and peaceful trade in the Indo-Pacific. So I'll briefly touch on the first one, strengthening our partnerships. First and foremost, Australia will deepen defence partnerships with regional nations who share our interests and most importantly who share our adherence to democratic values and philosophies. For over 70 years, the United States has supported economic growth and protected norms and principles that have underwritten our region's security and prosperity. 
at Osmin last week, as Governor Beasley uh, noted, uh, the Indian Ocean was a key point of discussion, and uh, we discussed it very comprehensively. In particular to the Indian Ocean, we committed to work more closely together to support sustainable and resilient in infrastructure, to support adherence to international law, and also to cooperate more closely and in consultation with each other with key regional partners. We discussed two regional partners in particular. The first one was uh, increasing both of our defence relationships with India. Uh, our defence relationship has, uh, with India has flourished over the last few years. And I think the figures on our uh, bilateral defence activities speak volumes. In 2014, we conducted 11 defence activities together. And by last year, that had increased to 38 bilateral military activities every year. And we're well and truly on track this year to sustain, if not to grow, that uh, record number. But it's not just the number. The scale and complexities of this year's bilateral Navy exercise, uh, Oz Index, saw the largest Australian task group ever sent to India. It focused on anti-submarine warfare, and the exercise demonstrated the high degree of trust that now exists between the militaries of our two nations. But there is scope to further increase the depth and com complexity of our uh, joint activities, both in the air, land and sea domains. And I have extended an invitation to my Indian counterpart to visit Australia later this year to further discuss those relationships and also, going, all going well, to, uh, to sign some new agreements with India. The second country at Osmin we discussed in some detail was Indonesia another country to our immediate north that also straddles both the Indo and the Pacific. Um, and I think very significantly is another country in our region that shares, again, our values and adherence to democratic principles and freedoms. Both Australia and Indonesia share a, a desire for a stable and secure maritime order, one that has unimpeded trade, adherence to international law, and also freedom of navigation and freedom of overflight. We're all, we are both, Indonesia and Australia, respected maritime security actors with good track records in the Indian Ocean. Australia and Indonesia are actively promoting enhanced cooperation through our respective multilateral maritime security exercises, Komodo and Kakadu. We're also working very closely through the Indian Ocean Rim Association, as well as the Indian Ocean Naval Symposium and also the Western Pacific Naval Symposium to build maritime security cooperation to the benefit of us all and also to the benefit of the region. It is very much in Australia's national interest to see this cooperation with both nations and other uh, partners in the region over the next few years. The second point was increasing our presence uh, in the Indian Ocean. The ADF has a very long and proud history of supporting Indian Ocean security through both military and also humanitarian activities. Our Australian naval uh, ships recently completed their 67th rotation with the combined maritime force combating transnational crime in the Northwest Indian Ocean and also in the Middle East Ocean. We've supported a range of humanitarian and disaster relief activities and we've delivered uh, complex and sustained search and rescue operations in the Indian Ocean. But we do need to now to step up this engagement through an increased tempo of port visits, engagements and exercises. Uh, in 2019, our premier maritime activity, Indo-Pacific Endeavour, for the first time focused on the Indian Ocean rim. The task group visited Sri Lanka and then India for the biennial activity Oz Index. It then transited to the Pacific for activities in Malaysia, Thailand, Vietnam, Singapore, and also Indonesia. Again, this underlined the link between th these two oceans for our nation's security. The third uh, aspect of our strategy is building collaboration. And uh, continuous investment in the Indian Ocean security architecture is now critically important. A stronger web of regional architecture will promote dialogue, trust and understanding between us and our regional friends and allies right across the Indian Ocean Rim. But it will also better equip the region to deal with political and security challenges that are making them very nervous. 
The Indian Ocean Rim Association will remain important for strengthening consultations and reinforcing rules-based habits. The search, I think, for Malaysian Airlines MH370 demonstrated to many of us just how little we actually understand what goes on in the Indian Ocean. While we cannot moderate our behaviour in the region, we can't do that without being able to monitor and track what is occurring above and also below the surface of the Indian Ocean. And, but Australia can't build that picture alone. As we particularly welcome India's uh, recent leadership in this regard in the establishment of an information fusion centre for the Indian Ocean region, which will help us all uh, shed some light on currently unseen activities across those Indian Ocean seams. Uh, and the fourth uh, strategy that the government is implementing is investing in capability, because a capable and agile ADF is also critical to achieving regional vision our regional vision. So the Morrison government is supporting the ADF to advance and protect our interests across the Indo-Pacific. Investing in a capable and potent defence force, one that can not only provide credible deterrence and withstand counter coercion, is an integral part of this plan. And a point I've now made several times about this $200 billion investment by the Morrison government on behalf of the Australian taxpayer and citizens is not just to invest in our people, our defence industry and Australian labour. Um, I see that as a very important byproduct and a statement of confidence in Australian industry, but we're actually doing it because we need the capability. When you have a look at the rising uh, range of threats, both conventional and new, this capability is necessary, which is why we're working with the defence industry to make sure that we can realise this capability. So in conclusion, strategic challenges in our region are increasing. Geostrategic politics is back in old ways and in new ways. To respond, we must work more closely with partners across the region and also across the globe. And building our links and also our capability in the Indian Ocean will be critical to our security. So I've outlined briefly today how the ADF, through its partnerships, its presence, its collaboration and its capability across the Indian Ocean, is fit to further exploit these opportunities, but also to protect us against the rising challenges. And by doing so, the government ensures that it is fulfilling its first prime duty of securing and defending our nation. Thank you.